What would you say, based on your uh, research, are the most effective foods for enhancing energy and promoting brain health? At the top of my list are definitely dark leafy greens. Um, that would be number one. There's so many. Um, I think we've learned a lot from research on the Mediterranean diet that really following those principles is the best for brain health um, and development. So for not just for adults, children as well. Um, also, you know, uh, fruits, vegetables, rich in antioxidants. Um, and then foods with you know high levels of healthy fats. Hmm. Um, so olive oil, um, certainly foods like salmon. So um, certain nuts like walnuts, almonds. Um, so a diet rich in those elements is good for the adult brain and good for the pediatric brain. Wow, I love it. And your expertise as a pediatric neurologist. You're the the second pediatric neurologist that we've had on the show, and uh, I love it because the, the the brain for an infant and a child is it's under rapid development. An organization, and so the needs of a the the neurological needs of a mm -hmm. child from a nutritional standpoint probably very intensive, right? That's right, and That's often right. overlooked. Yes, and can be a little bit harder to sh shape and mold hmm. a child's diet, um, especially nowadays with you know kind of the the you know the standard American diet. Yeah, um, and it's it can be harder for children to um, expand their diet and have the you know, access to the whole foods, nutrient-dense foods that are so important for brain health. Mm. What are children typically eating today in this country, 2024? Yeah, unfortunately, highly processed foods. Um, lots of simple carbohydrates, um, lots of additives and preservatives. Um, and they tend to stick kind of to the same limited number of foods mm. um, rather than the variety that we know is needed mm. for you know, health of brain and body. What do we do for picky picky eaters, children who are picky eaters? Yeah, so I would say, well, first it's very common, um, but the the technique that I've come across that is, is most effective is called food chaining. Whoa. So it's a technique where you take the foods that a child is willing to eat, that they eat regularly, um, and then you gradually introduce other foods one at a time that are similar in some way to the food the child already likes. Hmm. Um, so, for example, if they eat apples, you might then introduce a pear because it's a similar consistency and flavor, but slightly different. Um, and then once a new food is added, you want to add it in gradually, a small amount. Um, and then once a child's willing to, to eat it, you make it a consistent um, part of their routine. So you keep it, you know, every few days and then you try to extend again. So it's a very gradual approach, but very effective. How important is um, modeling from the parent side? Hugely important, hugely important. So children see what their family members eat. Um, they see the, their family members' response to different foods, and it really makes a difference. Hmm. So, um, you know, helping your child to eat healthy by being a model yourself is very important. Today, I mean, adults, 60% of the calories that your average adult consumes comes from these highly processed, mm -hmm. ultra processed foods. And I think that the proportion last I checked was even higher for kids. It was mm. like something like 70%, mm. which is shocking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So the, the topic of your new book is autism. That's also the area of your expertise. You've mm -hmm. done a lot of really exciting work in the field. Um, how much do we know about the etiology of autism? Well, the cause? Yeah, we're really lucky in that um, research has come a very long way. So. You know, autism wasn't even first described or under known until the 1940s. Um, and then for many, many decades, just little was known about autism. Um, and certainly very little was known about what caused autism or increased the likelihood of autism. Um, for a while, it was even thought to be related to parenting and, and blamed on parents, you know. So we had a lot of misconceptions in the past. But now we know that autism really comes about because of a, a complex interactions between certain genetic factors and then certain what we call environmental factors. And so those genetic factors could be um, differences a person might have in their chromosomes or even like single gene mutations. There are now over a hundred different genetic factors or wow. variants that we know can influence the brain um, and increase the likelihood of autism. Um, and then in the environmental category, that's in some ways even more interesting because um, we, we now understand a lot more than we used to. And those kind of fall into a few different categories. So one relates to what really you can think of as toxin exposures. Um, so those are things like, um, you know, 
for example, medications that a child, a fetus might be exposed to if the mother was taking certain medications. But even things like industrial chemicals that are now very widespread in our environment that are even detected in newborn cord blood, unfortunately, um, we know can have an effect on brain development um, and increase the, the likelihood of autism. Wow. Um, and then there's another big category related to maternal health factors. So things like gestational diabetes mellitus, um, even obesity, uh, so metabolic conditions in the mother, but also autoimmune conditions in the mother seem to affect the fetus's developing brain. Wow. Yeah. I've, I, I recall reading a study um, that linked maternal use of acetaminophen mm. during pregnancy to autism. Mm. Does that ring a bell? It does. There, you know, it's, there haven't been conclusive findings, but um, one theory is that use of acetaminophen, because it can affect um, the mitochondrial function, could then, in some people who have a genetic susceptibility, uh, might then you know, be one of the environmental factors that comes into play for autism. Wow. In the field of dementia, there's a saying that once you've seen one case of dementia, you've seen one case of dementia. Yeah. That um, all instances are are unique, mm -hmm. really. You know, it's a it's there's not there's likely not one single cause mm -hmm. for every person. You know, it's probably distinct right. just distinct causes for each per each, each sufferer of the condition. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's um, is there similarity? Yes. So it's it's very similar for autism because there are a number of different genetic factors and environmental factors that interact in very complex ways. So for each person, it's really a unique set of those factors and then how they interact. So it very much is that um, each person has a unique type of autism. Hmm. You can think of it that way, and a unique biology that underlies their autism. Are we seeing rates increase of autism prevalence? Yes, so the data from the CDC suggests that autism rates have increased tremendously. Um, the most recent data um, looks like one in 36 children wow. now has, has a diagnosis of autism. And that's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of percent higher than it was just, you know, 10 years ago. So um, there are a number of uh, theories for why that's increasing. One is that part of it is related to increased awareness and increased diagnosis, and that's a good thing. Um, but that doesn't explain all of it. Um, the rest is very likely due to an increase in these types of uh, non-genetic factors, but even a greater rate of genetic variants, um, which also have to do with, um, you know, are linked to other health factors as well. So, um, yes, autism is rising in prevalence, and we actually know a lot about why. And it's not just because we're getting better at diagnosing it. No, it's not. Wow, that is shocking. I've heard, I've heard you make the connection between mitochondrial health mm -hmm. and autism. What are mitochondria and what is the connection between mitochondrial health and, and yeah. this condition? So, you know, mitochondria, the role of mitochondria in many different brain conditions is increasingly being understood, including dementia. Um, but for autism, it was really just in the past two decades that some research began to show very high rates of what we call mitochondrial dysfunction in autism. So mitochondria are tiny structures inside of cells that are really at the heart of metabolism. So they're important for converting nutrients into energy in the form of ATP, um, and they're involved in lots and lots of other aspects of um, the body's biochemistry. Um, but when mitochondria aren't functioning well, it can really um, get in the way of proper brain and body function, and especially brain development. Um, different parts of the body have different energy requirements. The brain is hugely um, is a huge in huge need of energy, and especially at certain times of life, like um, the first few years of life when the brain is growing and changing rapidly um, through puberty, for example. And um, and so there are now many studies showing uh, looking both at uh, blood markers, tissue markers. Um, some of my research using brain imaging to look directly at brain tissue has shown that um, mitochondrial dysfunction is part of autism. Um, perhaps not for all, but for a, a very large percentage. Wow. Yeah. yeah, prior to your work, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they were primarily using blood markers, right? That's right, that's right. Mainly blood markers, um, which are a, a, a good biomarker. Like a surrogate. Um, yes, yes. Um, but we know that mitochondria in different parts of the body can be functioning differently. So in one part of the body, they may be functioning perfectly fine and another not. So it's it's good to 
get as direct um, a test as possible for the organ and tissue that you're interested in, in this case, the brain. Wow. So how do you then measure mitochondrial function in the brain? Yeah, so um, the tool that we used in the research that I've done um, is using brain magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So it's a form of brain MRI, so brain imaging. Um, but it's a unique uh, approach to brain imaging that allows us to measure different chemical levels, uh, metabolites, and especially for mitochondrial function, the level of lactate um, in brain tissue as a, as a biomarker for how well mitochondria are doing. Interesting. Lactate yeah. is built up like in our muscles, right? That's when right. We're, when we're exercising. Yeah, yeah. And it builds up in the brain too. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, isn't it, can, haven't we recently discovered that the brain can use it as a, as a fuel source actually? It can, yes. Uh, like other parts of the body, yes. Um, but it's um, not ideal and for long-term use. Hmm. Um, and then when it's elevated, it is a sign of mitochondria um, stress and dysfunction. Wow. Yeah. So then in, so kids with, with autism, then mm -hmm. you're seeing what reduced me metabolism? Yes. So higher levels of lactate reduced, uh, basically reduced function. Some, some, some part on the pathway of mitochondria metabolism is disrupted. Wow. Yeah. And are we, do we think that it's like, it's due to some kind of toxic exposure that essentially poisons the mitochondria? Well, mitochondria are very sensitive, so they're susceptible to um, lots and lots of different stressors. I, I like to think of them as stressors, but mm. they can come in lots of different forms. So certainly, yes, some toxins um, in our environment, even some medications can harm mitochondria. Um, inflammation, so anything that increases inflammation in the body can then adversely affect mitochondrial function. Um, states of chronic stress, um, oxidative stress. Uh, so there are lots of ways, um, yeah, lots of ways that mitochondria might end up taking a hit. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Stress. Yeah. Stress is a major, mm -hmm. is a major killer. So how do, how do we then, um, how do we prevent mitochondrial dysfunction? But if one is already suffering from a condition associated mm -hmm. with mitochondrial dysfunction, how do we improve yeah. the health of our mitochondria? Well, what's so interesting is, um, that. The, the, the kinds of lifestyle factors that improve health really for all people related to nutrition and exercise um, do so because they benefit mitochondrial function, they help reduce inflammation and, and chronic stress states. And the same is true for children and for autism. So um, interestingly, some of the, um, the best research in autism has looked at the effects of exercise. Hmm. And we know exercise has just tremendous benefits, right, to, to body, brain and body health. And the research shows that exercise improves social abilities, communication, language, executive function, uh, emotion regulation, um, and overall quality of life in autism. So it really is an underutilized intervention that could, can have tremendous benefits. Hmm. Fascinating. And I've also heard you talk about certain nutrients, like specific micronutrients. Yes. That can yes, play a role. Yes. So when you think about nutrition supplementation, so it's one of the main categories. There are, in my view, six main ways of kind of approaching and supporting autism. The first relates to lifestyle factors like exercise, but also improving sleep and um, those, those types of um, interventions. The next relates to nutritional supplements. Um, and my approach is really first to to do um, the, the type of blood and urine testing, stool testing as well, that can give us insight into a child's biology. Because if there are nutritional deficiencies present, the first step in supplementation is to correct those. Hmm. Um, so for example, iron deficiency, a vitamin D deficiency, B12, and there are many others. Um, but even beyond that, there are a lot of nutritional supplements that can help um, for example, for mitochondrial function, we know L-carnitine, creatine, uh, many of the B vitamins, vitamin C and E. They're just, there's a role for many different um, supplements to enhance mitochondrial function. Um, and then there are some supplements that can help specific, very specific symptoms, like um, for sleep disturbance, which is very common. About 80% of, of autistic children will experience sleep disturbance at some point. Um, and that can really get in the way, you know, sleep essential for brain development. Um, and so melatonin, magnesium, even some um, cannabis related products like cannabidiol, 
Um, there's just a, a whole host of different nutritional supplements that can potentially help sleep and therefore help brain function. Is there not some concern uh, surrounding the use of melatonin in the, in the pediatric setting? There is. So um, the worry is that long-term use of melatonin might suppress a person's endogenous or internal production of melatonin. Um, and that's something important to keep in mind. So we try to use it short-term if possible and use it while we're putting in place other measures like sleep hygiene measures, like increasing light exposure, increasing exercise, um, uh, reducing simple carbohydrates in the diet, for example. Um, but we also know that for some children, um, their bodies no matter whether they're on melatonin or not, their body's not producing enough. Mm. Um, and so for them, long-term use may actually be the right answer. So it really depends on the child. This is so interesting. I mean, for anybody listening who has a loved one with autism, but also, I mean, across the, across the, the lifespan, I mean, these are all things that I think are broadly applicable yes. to anybody with a brain. That's right. That's right. And for the longest time, I've just 20 or 30 years ago, if you asked a doctor, could dietary changes help a child with autism? They would have said, you know, overwhelmingly have said no, because it was almost unthinkable that a brain condition that was viewed largely as genetic and largely as being static and unchanging could somehow benefit from improved nutrition. But now we know better. Mm. We know that it's incredibly important. And even in my view, it's, if you have a neurodevelopmental condition, even more important. That nutrition will make and even have potentially even more benefits um, to wow. health. You've mentioned some specific nutrients like carnitine, um, creatine, uh, carnosine, I believe, that are considered carnonutrients because of their prevalence in animal source foods. Yes, and we see a lot of um, we see a lot of uh, you know pushback from whether you know, documentaries on television to even marketing from the food industry itself, pushing people towards more, a more plant-based mm. way of eating. Mm. Where does, uh, what's your sort of read on that situation, given that so many of these seemingly valuable sure. mitochondrial supporting nutrients are to be found mm -hmm. in animal source foods? Well, I think it is very individual. So, you know, for the children that I work with, um, where their diets often are more limited, I just think you really want to emphasize the, the foods where the nutrients are, are the most dense and bioavailable. Um, so people have certain preferences around their diet that are important. You know, personal preferences really matter. But when I counsel the families that I work with, it really is about understanding that child's unique biology and needs and figuring out how we can get the nutrition into them, you know, in the most efficient way. And often that does involve um, animal products. Yeah, I don't have a child, but I just about a year and a half ago became an uncle. And uh, we found something really funny that we found is that our, my little baby niece, I mean, she loves, she loves to eat animal source. She loves to eat meat. She loves, uh -huh. you know, if we're eating barbecue, you know, if we've got barbecue uh, you know, if my, if my brother smoked some ribs or what have you, she, you know, she preferentially reaches towards, mm. you know, the animal source food, mm. like whether it's chicken or, you know, some of these like smoked ribs and things like that. She really seems to have ha have this like natural inclination towards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. animal source foods. Yeah. 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 Which I think is, you know, we have to meet kids where they're at, you know, yeah. rather than try to push our whatever di dietary ideology we have right. onto them. I think it's really important to, you know, meet them where they're at. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, uh, the Mediterranean dietary pattern. What is, what would you say are some of the tenets of that? So, um, olive oil, um, very minimal meat and dairy, um, and an emphasis on whole, you know, unprocessed, uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, certainly leafy greens, um, whole grains, seeds, nuts. Hmm. Um, and what's so interesting, I mean, that, I think the Mediterranean diet is one that very few children nowadays are eating. Um, but the research really does show that it's great for, um, for brain health, um, for sleep, for example, which is such a struggle for so many um, children with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. So um, I think it's, from my point of view, it's a great starting point. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of interest in autism in elimination diets, you know, taking things out away from a child's diet. 
there is some risk to that, especially if a child's diet is already narrow, then you can really risk um, true nutrient deficiencies. Um, and I also have seen in the process of eliminating certain foods that a child's diet becomes more highly processed. They're replacing those foods with processed foods. And that's, I think, not the answer, because that, mm. I think, can promote inflammation and, and has other uh, consequences. So you just have to be really thoughtful about those changes. Yeah. I concede that the, the Mediterranean diet, as it's sometimes described, it, it's, it's occasionally you hear it described as a low meat diet, but that to me is, is, is nonsensical. Yeah, I don't think that's, yeah, that's not the, the emphasis. I think the emphasis is really um, a, a whole foods you know, nutrient rich diet. Yeah, um, I would agree. A whole yeah. foods diet. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Mediterranean dietary pattern to me is just, it's, it's a dietary pattern that is a whole foods. It's primarily comprised of whole foods and it's palatable to the Western palate. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other dietary patterns I believe that are associated with, with health that is just as robust, mm. but perhaps not as palatable to to yeah. a Westerner, you know, mm -hmm. like a Japanese dietary pattern is fantastic, right? Yes. But it's like, you're going to get a, an infant with a Western palate to, you know, start eating natto and, <laughs> you know, sashimi and whatever, you right. know, like it just, it doesn't, um, right. so that, that's why I understand where the, you know, I, I understand where the, the Mediterranean, the push towards these Mediterranean style diets, yeah. um, seems to come from. In autism, there seem there is a big there's a looming sort of um, focus on the role of the gut microbiome, is there not? Mm -hmm. There seems to be gut dysbiosis yes. in a large proportion of children mm -hmm. with people, you know, people with, with autism. Mm -hmm. What can you share about that? Yeah, so um, gut dysbiosis, um, also reduced diversity of the gut microbiota, so just fewer species overall. Um, and interestingly, at, at um, the the, at Cortica, the um, health center that um, I founded, we're in the process of running clinical trials for a novel uh, medication that um, targets the gut for autism. Hmm. So we're involved in the first clinical trials of this novel medication in children. Um, so the, the gut is ex extremely important in autism. Um, we hear a lot about the gut-brain axis, um, all the ways that the, the brain and the gut are interconnected. Uh, through direct neural connections, but through hormones and lots of other ways. Um, so gut health um, is extremely important in autism. What we don't quite know at the moment, um, research hasn't quite advanced far enough, is sort of the chicken and egg phenomenon, <laughs> right? So we know that if someone is eating a fewer, less range of foods and lots of highly processed foods, it'll change their gut microbiome. Um, and we know that often that's the case in autism. But we also know that um, issues with the gut uh, including inflammation, increased permeability of the um, intestinal lining, can then um, lead to some things being absorbed into the bloodstream, maybe then activating the immune system, affecting the brain in that way, even going to the brain. So, um, and that could can then lead to you know, neurodevelopmental symptoms. So we don't quite know. My my hunch is that for different children, it's different. So for some, it's uh, one direction, and for others, it's the, it's the other direction. But um, without question, GI symptoms and disorders are among the most common co-occurring condition with autism. Uh, things like chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, um, states of inflammation of the stomach, the esophagus, the intestines, uh, dysbiosis. These are incredibly common. The research suggests 80% or more of wow. autistic individuals have one or more of these conditions. Um, and you can just imagine these can really get in the way of, uh, of learning, of focus, of, you know, attention. Um, it can be a source of pain, um, disrupt sleep. So it's really important to, um, to detect them and then properly manage them. The medication that you're studying, what does that do? Um, it sort of sequesters. It, it basically um, helps to remove um, metabolites in the gut that are potentially harmful to the, to the brain if they're absorbed. So it's almost, and it largely stays in the gut. So it, it's almost like it helps to clean out um, those, those toxins and waste products. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we've learned recently, we had a gastroenterologist on the show, brilliant uh, Aussie-based, Aussie doctor named uh, Dr. Pran Yoganathan, who shared very um, eloquently the relationship between the gut and systemic inflammation that the gut seems to be this this mediator between, you know, and the gut is an organ unto itself, but nonetheless, it mm -hmm. seems to really um, 
be a huge lever with regard mm -hmm. to either reducing or dialing up inflammation, depending mm -hmm. on the state of the gut microbiome, dietary exposures, and the mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Have you yeah. found that to be uh, clinically yes. true as well? Yes. And, um, you know, it's, it's the surface of the body that is most sort of permeable, you know, to the outside world. And it's... Uh, surface area is enormous so um yes it's important it's importance for brain health and children is um is really now just beginning to be understood um but i think such an important area for future research hmm. yeah. so what are the most effective then intervention strategies for a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder yeah well we talked about um, lifestyle changes um, dietary changes nutritional supplements there are three other main categories, um, so medications. Um, there's a really interesting, fairly new category called um, neuromodulation or device type therapies. Um, those, uh, some of those administer like electrical signals to the nervous system or magnetic signals. So that's a very interesting area of innovation. And then the last major, major category is what we call developmental or behavioral approaches. Those are things like um, like therapies to help uh, with behavior or with sensory processing or motor, um, so like occupational therapy, speech language therapy. Um, so that's also another you know large uh, toolkit hmm. to help support development. Can you share any case studies? I mean, children that you've worked with that have adopted your protocol yeah. um, and seen success as yeah. a result? Well, um, there's so many. And part of what I love about my work is that we get to see every day just the tremendous progress and gains and 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 what's possible. Um, but I will say, you know, um, there's a, a young child that I worked with who came to us when he was two years old. And right away, um, you know, one of the most important things when a child has a diagnosis of autism is then to look at the underlying biology. And so that means doing uh, tests, you know, medical testing, like a genetic testing, um, a test of blood and urine to look at uh, biochemistry and metabolism. Um, for most children, it, it also involves doing a test called an electroencephalogram, an EEG, which measures the brain's electrical activity. And so all these pieces of data for this young boy um, gave us really important insight into his underlying biology. He had a genetic diagnosis. Um, he had seizures, um, which were only happening at sleep, in sleep. So had we not done an EEG, we never would have known he was having seizures. Um, we did a stool analysis and we found that he had quite a high level of dysbiosis and signs of inflammation in his gut. And so with all that information, we could then provide him the appropriate treatments, um, involving medications to control the seizures. And we were fortunate that we were able within a year to stop his seizures. Um, we put him on a, a low glycemic index diet, which, um, is, is actually a diet that's known to, um, to stop seizures. Um, and uh, has other benefits um, like reducing inflammation in the body. Um, and uh, he actually benefit, had a lot of benefit from a gluten-free diet. That's not appropriate for all children, but for some it can make a big difference. Um, and with all of those things, plus um, beginning speech language therapy, occupational therapy, behavior therapy, his development really um, got back on track. And within a few years, he no longer had an autism diagnosis. Wow. So that kind of outcome is possible, but it takes a very multi-pronged approach based on a really thorough understanding of the child's underlying biology and their you know, developmental profile. Mm. How do you determine where to start? Because I would imagine for a parent, you know, all of these different interventions could be overwhelming, especially yeah. if you try to pile them all at, on all at once. Yes. I mean, I think... The, it's both exciting to know that so many different things can have an impact, but also overwhelming. And so I like to say that really the place to start, there are lots of different places one can start, and the place to start is, is where the, the family feels most comfortable and most capable of carrying through. There are some families who really want to try all you know, of the developmental therapies before they try medication, for example. And in my view, that's a great approach. There's some families who want to try the medication first, and as long as we feel that that's, you know, the, the benefits outweigh the risks, that's a reasonable approach. There are some families who are extremely motivated to change the diet, and maybe that's part of, part of the parent's lifestyle. Um, and that's wonderful, and we can start there. But for some other families, it's almost impossibly hard to change the diet. Um, and to do to try starting there would just have them experience a sense of frustration and failure. And so although ultimately we want to get to the place where we can do it all, 
often in the beginning we can't and that's okay right so you got you meet meet them meet the family where yes. they're at Mm -hmm. You mentioned the benefits of a low glycemic diet in the setting of epilepsy. Is that has that been shown to be as effective as a ketogenic diet? Because I know that they're mm. they're similar, I yes. guess, but they're not they're not identical in the sense that a ketogenic is a very very low carbohydrate diet, and the and a low glycemic diet is not necessarily a low carbohydrate diet. It's just very. Um, the, the quality of the carbohydrates is more relevant. That's right. So there are some studies actually out of Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, that show uh, the low glycemic index diet when done really well and carefully can be as effective as the ketogenic diet wow. for seizure reduction and seizure control. Um, the, the ketogenic diet um, overall is, is generally more effective for seizure control, but also harder to implement, more risk of potential side effects. And so compliance may be more of a challenge. It's much more, so, much more restrictive. That's right. That's right. So you just have to balance those different factors. What does a low glycemic diet look like? Uh, it's mainly, you know, increasing proteins and fats and reducing the intake of simple carbohydrates. Yeah. Got it. Like sugars, added sugars, and yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. There's some, I mean, bewildering statistic. Children consume something like 30, 40 teaspoons of sugar a day, mm -hmm. added sugar every day. Yeah. That's crazy to yeah. me. Yeah. Is sugar, much has been made about the, the, the health effects of sugar, right? Mm -hmm. Some argue that, you know, a little bit of sugar here and there, particularly in a state of energy balance, is mm -hmm. no big deal. Others, you know, will make the assertion on social media, which I, I disagree with mm -hmm. that any amount of added sugar mm -hmm. is toxic for you, which mm -hmm. I think that I think at this point we, you know, we have a much uh, deeper understanding of you know, of, of, of nutrition to the degree that we know that a little bit of sugar here and there is actually probably fine. It's that mm -hmm. sugar has no satiety benefit and it's essentially just empty calories is the big, is the big problem with it. Yeah. But do you, do you have maybe a different perspective on that? You know, families will often ask me, um, interestingly about fruit, you know, cause they, they will, many families consider fruit, um, you know, to be not sugar. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, that's really not the place to focus one's energy. It's really on the processed, you know, added added sugars. So, honestly, it's, it's really just about having a balanced view and seeing what's possible for a particular child and family. Um, but I don't think anyone benefits from some of these very, very stringent rules applied across the board. Um, yeah. So it, it so much depends on, especially in, in the with the children I work with, so much depends on kind of their unique, you know, um, situation. Yeah. On social media today, I mean, people that you you'll find somebody willing to demonize pretty much every ingredient yeah. that exists. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel, I feel for parents who, you know, maybe they get, that they get exposed to some, you know, social media persona that, that demonizes fruit yeah. and, and, and more natural forms for, you know, whole food sources of naturally occurring mm -hmm. sugar. And I really feel for them because mm -hmm. I mean, fruit is not the problem. Exactly. It's a, mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, but it's hard to know. There's just so much inform, you know, information and misinformation out there. It can yeah. be hard to know. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so it's fascinating. So you've seen children basically enter remission from autism. Well, in fact, we know is that the right terminology? Like they, yeah. they seem to be in remission. So I, the way I like to phrase it is, a child who may meet the diagnostic criteria at one point in time may then over time no longer meet the diagnostic criteria. Hmm. That's how I like to frame it because the diagnostic the criteria, they have changed over time. And they're also quite subjective. You know, they're about what you observe in a child's behavior and the way they socialize and communicate. So um, I like to frame it that way. We know that even now, somewhere probably around 10% of children who receive an autism diagnosis at one time will at some later point no longer meet the criteria for that diagnosis. Um, and it, it does tend to be the children who had milder symptoms to start with um, and higher levels of language and, and uh, that, that type of profile. Hmm. Um, but, um, you know, I, I do feel, especially nowadays with um, the neurodiversity movement, which is such a powerful and important um, movement, that it's important not to think of autism itself as... Um, as even as a disorder or as something that should be cured or fixed. A lot of people think of it as an important part of their identity. Hmm. Um, and so 
we just want to be careful around how we talk about it, both honoring and valuing and unique autistic strengths and differences, but also offering um, the highest quality of healthcare, supports, learning opportunities, um, and access to just excellent, excellent healthcare. Yeah. How did you get into this field? So, um, you know, I had a, just a, a wonderful experience when I was a teen. So I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. And um, when I was in high school, I volunteered at a summer camp for children with um, autism, cerebral palsy, um, intellectual disability, spina bifida, epilepsy. Um, and it was being a volunteer at this summer camp um, that made a really strong impression on me, um, seeing the joy that was possible, the learning. Um, and what was really wonderful about this camp was they would pair a neurotypical camp counselor with a neurodivergent camp counselor. So my co-counselor had cerebral palsy. And I remember he was in a wheelchair, he difficult, had difficulty speaking, but incredibly bright, had a wonderful sense of humor. And it was through that friendship that I came to be to see neurodivergence in a, in a new way and felt very much that I wanted to I wanted to use my abilities to the best that I could to help um, others be able to grow new abilities. Wow. So you decided to go into medicine and off the bat was your was pediatric neurology your your focus? I was interested in all of neurology. Hmm. Um, actually, adult neurology, uh, neurodegenerative conditions were very interesting to me. Um, but then ultimately it was the, you know, brain development. Um, I just thought, you know, what what's more fascinating than how the brain, you know, grows and changes over time and gains new skills. So that led me to pediatrics. So cool. Yeah. And so what inspired you to write your latest book, which is fascinating, by the way, I highly recommend people check it out, Magnificent mm -hmm. Minds. I know this is not your first book, right? Right. I um, About 10 years ago, co-wrote a book with a, a developmental psychologist who was a mentor of mine. Um, but this is the first book that I've written on my own, really based on a set of ideas that um, have been brewing for about the past 10 years um, and related to the work that we do at Cortica, where we provide this kind of whole child approach for autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions to support children and families uh, really in this holistic and integrated way. Um, and so Magnificent Minds was my, you know, I had, I've been doing this, um, this work for about 25 years. And every time families come to me, um, I've always wanted to be able to recommend a single book to them, <laughs> you know, that busy parents could get through quickly, um, that could provide what I think of as the, the liquid gold, you know, the most important information. Um, and there was no book out there to recommend. And so a few years ago, I thought, um, I want to I want to be able to provide that book and that's what really motivated me to write Magnificent Minds. Yeah, it's so important and there and you're right there is much greater awareness now um, around this condition than I think there ever has been in the past. I mean, you have hit shows on Netflix like Love on the Spectrum mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Have you seen it? I have. Yeah. It's so good. Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. I mean, you you see such I mean, the the, the personalities and the, yeah. the just the, the the amount of heart yes exhibited Mm -hmm. by these by these adults you know with, with this right. condition it's um that's right but uh yeah it's i think it's so valuable to be able to access the tools like you're providing mm -hmm. um because yeah with increased awareness i think there's the the increased desire to to you know improve quality of life yes. to improve you know yes. all these different many many facets yeah. and just to know so much is possible mm. you know so much more is possible today for a child with you know a diagnosis of autism than it was you know in the past mm. so it's a it's a diagnosis that i hope when parents receive they'll they won't feel help hopeless or helpless which i think in the past was often the case that they will understand that there's a lot of reason to hope and some wonderful things in the future for them and for their child um, but along the way a few things really matter a lot mindset is one of them having the right support, um, and um, being able to see strengths in their own child. One of the things that I talk about in the book is understanding that intelligence is not just one thing. It's not just IQ. Intelligence comes in so many different forms, and that um, one of the exciting things that parents will, can do is to nurture all the different types of their child's intelligence. And so um, I feel that's really important. That plus a strengths-based approach really Focusing on strengths and growing from them, not focusing on what we perceive to be deficits or deficiencies hmm. um, or limitations. 
Um, and that's, that's a pretty big shift away from where, how we used to view neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, and I think as professionals, so many of us were trained to look for primarily limitations and deficits, you know, to think about what's wrong rather than really um, what's possible. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. What excites you about the future of uh, the treatment of autism? Well, um, I think you know research is moving at a very rapid pace, and I think in a lot of exciting directions, like you know research into the effects of gut health on brain development, um, like new neuromodulation therapies, so the use of um, types of magnetic stimulation to change electrical function in the brain. Um, there's there's an approach to um, neuromodulation that we use in our clinic that uh, stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system um, by electrical stimulation to the vagus nerve, and that has tremendous benefits for health and brain function and brain development. So I'm excited for all of these new avenues of research, um, and and I'm also equally excited for more and more autistic individuals to make contributions to the world because I think there are forms of autistic intelligence. Um, there are just these unique ways of thinking, uh, real strengths in understanding um, systems, mechanisms, um, synthesizing data, you know, that come with autism. And I think with the, you know, with support, so many more um, individuals can, um, can contribute, you know, the, the amazing strengths they have. Absolutely. With the relationship between the gut and the brain that you've already um, sort of highlighted, it makes me wonder if there's been any research into a potential role for fecal microbial transplantation in the setting of autism. There has been research looking at it. Um, not enough. Um, I wish that there was more because it's still very early stages. But some of the initial research suggests that um, there can be benefits to some individuals through fecal microbiota transplants. And I've had some uh, patients in my practice who have benefited, who have taken part in research studies um, and then had benefits from that. Here in the U.S.? Yes. Mm -hmm. Some, it's not widely available. So to, to receive in the U.S. generally requires participation in a research study. Um, and I, I have seen you know some families uh, go to other countries also to receive it, which... I don't recommend just because it's, you know, we there's so so much we don't know about how it's being done. We worry about safety. Um, but participation in research trial is, is always, um, in my view, encouraged. Interesting. And have the results been positive thus far? Yes, so far, yes. Um, but the numbers are small, so it's, it's hard to say. And it's hard to know in which children. Um, the early research suggests it's probably in those those who have GI symptoms are probably the ones who are most likely to benefit. Hmm. So, you know, those who have chronic, you know, constipation or inflammation of the gut or um, chronic diarrhea, symptoms like that. I mean, it's so cool. Like the potential that a poop transplant <laughs> essentially can, uh, can influence the phenotype, right? Yes, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. they've shown in animal studies that they, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there have been these right. seminal studies. Yes. In the... In, with regard to the gut microbiome and its influence on obesity, right? In, mm -hmm. in like animal models, they've, mm -hmm. they've shown they've transplanted the gut, the, the microbiota from uh, lean mice into obese mice, mm -hmm. and they've made the obese mice lean right. with a poop transplant. That's crazy. <laughs> it's like science fiction. Yeah. Well, these things were unthinkable in the past, especially then taking that one step further to the brain. You know, who would have thought that altering the gut you know, could change the brain in such profound ways. But now we know it can. It's um, fascinating, yeah. I mean, I, I'm obsessively interested and curious about, um, you know, brain health. And uh, mm -hmm. and and oh, about a year and a half ago, two years, actually two years ago at this point, I had a weird nerve uh, mm -hmm. occurrence um, where I developed Horner syndrome. Oh. Yeah, are mm -hmm. you familiar? Well, yes. you must be familiar with that, yeah. Yes, yeah. But um, likely associated for me with migraines or possibly even idiopathic. Oh, like we, okay. you know, but we ruled uh, out all the bad stuff. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, and yeah, it was super strange. I mean, I was like in in Austin one weekend, and my my eyelid, my right eyelid, sunk to half mast. Oh. And uh, as soon as I got back to LA, I, I went to the emergency room. I did all these tests, imaging, ruled out the <laughs> stroke, brain tumor, all the bad stuff. Yeah. But I would occasionally get migraines. Oh. Um, 
and especially around fl- flights for me, mm. like the cabin pressure likely for me induced, you know, oh. had some kind of, some kind of impact because okay. the, the onset of Horner's for me was associated with this like travel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh. And the symptoms, I mean, more or less went away, but I mean, I still have mm-hmm. it. You have Horner's, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think it goes away very often, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. it's just, it's just fascinating how, like on the one hand, how much we know, you know, mm-hmm. given the complexity of the, of right. the human brain, but also right. how little we know. Yeah. Yeah. It is fascinating. And I, you know, for such a long time, the brain and especially kind of more cognitive behavioral types of brain conditions were thought of as kind of separate, you know, from the rest of the body. It was like we forgot that the head is connected to the body, you know. Um, And I think, honestly, I think it was especially true for children. Um, For some reason, there was just a a block in how we were thinking as a field, you know, in healthcare. Um, And I'm hopeful. I think that's changing. I think we're recognizing that um, those conditions have so much in common with all of the rest of you know, what we understand about the body. Um, so yeah, I think we're moving in some good directions. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a physician, what was, how much tr- training with regard to nutrition did you have? Very little. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it, you know, when I went to medical school, um, we had an eight week course that met once a week on nutrition. Wow. And it was very much public health oriented. It I wasn't think that's like public. more than most, right? <laughs> it might be, yeah. Most physicians I know get a little more than an afternoon yeah. worth of training. Yeah, um, it's sh- it's shocking. It's shocking, and it's it's a shame because then I think doctors don't feel equipped, and then and then patients are really left unsupported. Hmm. You know? So I hope that it's. I think I think that medical education has shifted. Um, certainly not. To the degree it needs to, but I think things are moving in that direction. Are there any foodborne additives that um, are particularly concerning to you? I know that, um, and you know, I, I have no idea actually where the science stands on this, but I know some are concerned about artificial food colorants, yeah. like red red forty, yes, um, and the like. So the research looking into ADHD um, has been has is is where we've seen, you know, some research findings suggesting additives, preservatives um, may be be harmful. Um, It's still unfortunately viewed as sort of equivocal. Um, And I think it's probably because when you're looking at uh, studying a a large group, whether it's autism or ADHD, you're getting a, a really varied, you're getting a very heterogeneous group where some may be more susceptible to things like food colorings and others may not. And then in that mixed group, you lose the signal. So that's why research is, is difficult. I, our field really needs to be able to subtype a little bit better or subgroup so that we can study um, a more focused group to, to, ident- to see the signal. Um, but yes, yeah, so one of the, the things you know, for ADHD, which actually is very common, ADHD often comes with autism. So it's, it's one of the co-occurring mental health conditions that's much more common in autism. So um, one of the dietary interventions that um, should be tried first for autism, especially with autism and ADHD together, is to um, really eliminate you know, food colorings first and then more broadly other other preservatives. And, you know, it's the research that I've looked into on sort of the connection between food colorings and um, brain health suggests that it might be mediated by mitochondrial function. Hmm. So why is it that these things might, you know, not be good for the brain? It's probably because of how they affect the function of mitochondria. Interesting. Yeah, I, um, I mean, it all comes down to food quality, in my view. I mean, you're not going to find red 40 in a a grass-fed steak. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to find it in, you know, smoked ribs. You're not going to find it in dark leafy greens. You're not going to find it in an avocado. That's right. Um, Mm -hmm. So it all comes back in my, in my view to food, to food quality and integrating a, 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 an array of both plant, you know, whole food plants and, and properly raised animal proteins. Yes. Yeah. I think it really, it, it almost always comes down to just that. You know, and so you know, a family may become concerned about something like a you know food dye, and then try to replace that child's 
candy with another type of candy that doesn't have, you know, food coloring. That's not the answer, mm. right? The answer is to, to move toward whole foods. Yeah. But I feel like our palates have been hijacked in so many ways by the food industry. Mm -hmm. And it starts from childhood, really. I mean, we grow up expecting these hyper palatable yeah. experiences, right? These mm -hmm. like hyper hedonic experiences when we eat, mm -hmm. which isn't to say that whole foods can't be delicious, palatable, hedonic, yeah. but processed. I mean, the, 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 the food agricultural complex are so good at creating these things that just, right. they push your brain to a bliss point. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like any drug of abuse, mm -hmm. really, you spend your entire life trying, you know, on that, yeah. on that hamster wheel of trying to get that same high. Right. Right. It's, yeah. And that's why, you know, there are, there are already so many things that are challenging about parenthood, but one place I think is, is worth a parent's attention is on the foods that their children eat. Yeah. And with regard to exercise, because we've also touched on some, you know, some really important lifestyle factors. Are there any specific types of exercise that seem to be more beneficial than others? Um, well, the good news is that there's likely benefit from many, many different types. So, in general, you know, exercise that um, is is aerobic in some, you know, uh, capacity is better, and um, exercise that is structured in some way. So one example that I'll give just because it's, it's been quite popular recently is that, you know, jumping on a trampoline may have some uh, benefits sort of because of the physical activity, but it's also highly unstructured and uh, very irregular. So a child engaging in that particular activity isn't being asked to truly control their motor system in kind of, you know, a structured, organized way. And so you're, while there may be some benefit, you're not getting the full benefit that could come. But there's so many other options, you know, even things like walking, um, hiking, riding a bike, riding a scooter, swimming. Um, those are excellent kind of entry points. Um, and then from there, I mean, any type of, um, you know, physical, like recreational sport, whether done in, for some children, it's hard to do in a group setting at first. But eventually getting there um, is ideal because then that sort of offers additional socialization opportunities and, and so forth. But um, start with, I say start with something that your child can already do and then gradually uh, increase from there. And there does appear to be more benefit from doing that exercise outdoors, you know, Interesting. in fresh air, in sunlight. Why, why do we think that's the case? You know, air quality is probably a big thing in general. Outdoor air quality is better than indoor. Not always, but in general. Um, and then we know sunlight is a um, number of different benefits. Um, one, for example, is exposure to sun, especially morning sun, then helps the circadian rhythm and helps promote quality sleep, um, helps vitamin D uh, levels. Uh, and there, you know, so, so the benefits of, of sunlight and fresh air, um, there, there are lots of benefits to those. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it makes perfect sense. Indoor air quality is something that um, you know most people think that being outdoors you're increasing your risk to pollution mm. relative to being indoors. But in you know when you're when you're indoors, particularly in a poorly ventilated yeah. space, mm -hmm. you're being exposed to VOCs, right? Volatile yes. organic compounds. You're being exposed to dust, mm -hmm. which is you know comprised of any number of, of endo, endo, right. pot potentially endocrine disrupting compounds, mm -hmm. mold possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a big fan of, you know, it's, and it's ironic because like the indoor, you know, as, as we advance as a society and we become more environmentally conscious, right? Like buildings become more, you know, more insulated as a means of cutting down on cost and energy mm -hmm. use for heating and cooling, mm -hmm. but that actually can increase your exposure of being exposed to indoor pollutants. Yeah. Yeah. And so getting outside mm -hmm. or at least, you know, keeping, keeping your windows open, I think, mm -hmm. um, very, uh, very smart. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, these, there's even a condition called sick building syndrome mm. where people develop these unexplained symptoms from being, yeah. from, from being indoors. And today, according, I believe it was the environmental working group or the EPA, mm -hmm. maybe it was the EPA that estimated we're spending about 90% of our time indoors, mm. 
which I mean, it just doesn't, you know, yeah. if you yeah. kept your dog indoors 90% <laughs> of the time, I mean, that would be animal abuse, right? Right, right. But we don't think twice about, yeah, yeah. about doing that to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So these, I mean, they're basics in my view, you know, and they, they really matter. And they, um, again, it's, it was, often people think there's some kind of huge leap between the, some of those basics and brain development. And there isn't a, at all, you know, they're, they're very uh, tightly connected. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you're not, you know, on the road doing the podcast circuit, promoting your new book, do you have a clinic down in San Diego? I do. In fact, uh, our Cortica Center in San Diego was our very first. Hmm. Um, and so we, I, it started out there as my private practice, um, just a one room office, um, just me and an assistant. And we have um, now 24 centers across the country. Uh, we have uh, one in San Diego. Um, we have several here in the LA area, also in Orange County. So most of our centers are on the West Coast, but we have um, centers in New Jersey, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Texas, Illinois, um, and we're we're expanding rapidly. So we expect to have a center likely in the Southeast, uh, one or more centers in the Southeast this year. Um, and yeah, and we've got a group of amazing over 2,000 doctors, therapists, mental health professionals, all specialized in neurodevelopment. So trying to really increase access to great healthcare. Mm. Yeah. So if people can take away the three most high impact interventions from this podcast, three mm. things that they could start doing today mm. to improve their brain health, what should they be doing? Well, that's such a great question. <laughs> you know, it depends. So if we're thinking about autistic children, it depends so much on that child's unique physiology. So I would say the first step is to find a healthcare professional who can help you understand your child's biology, who can, who knows um, what genetic testing or metabolic testing is needed, what is needed in terms of better understanding the child's uh, neurology. Is it an EEG? Is it a brain MRI? Um, would a stool analysis be helpful? So it's first investigating, coming to a much better understanding. Do you also recommend nutrient testing and heavy metal testing? Nutrient testing for sure. Um, heavy metal testing is trickier. So for, some, for things like lead, absolutely. Um, it can be a little bit harder to measure accurately other heavy metals. Um, but uh, it's important to do so if there's concern based on the child's history. Got it. So it all starts with a very, very careful and detailed medical history. Um, and then from there, I would say the second step is then evaluate the full range of options that you do have and think through with your healthcare professional what are likely to be the most high yield for your child and then develop sort of a priority list and, and go through them step by step. Um, unfortunately, today, there is a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to say, okay, once a child is diagnosed with autism, the very first thing that should happen is referrals for behavior therapy, which is also called ABA. While ABA is very important and can be extremely impactful, um, you're, you might be missing steps in between, um, especially steps related to understanding the child's specific uh, neurodevelopmental profile and their, their unique biology. Um, so it's really about tailoring and understanding all your options uh, based on that understanding. Got it. And what's the third tip? Exercise. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. And finding ways to move the body. Um, and I've seen some children um, just dramatically reduce their level of aggression, self-injury. I've seen dramatic gains in communication just from being able to take a hike twice a day. So two hours outdoors hiking. Um, and so... You know, for me, that's just, um, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you give your child that chance? Hmm. And what about supplementation? I mean, is there, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that neuroinflammation likely plays a role. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people, particularly uh, listeners of this podcast, are familiar at this point with ome- the role of omega-3 fatty mm-hmm. acids in terms of um, attenuating the inflammatory response. Mm-hmm. Um, any other sort of high lever supplements that you think, I mean, without, you know, taking a kitchen sink approach, but, um, some that might be, you know, might have more evidence in favor of investigating. Yeah. Uh, so omega-3 fatty acids for sure is a great place to start. Um, there are, uh, so there's some research evidence, um, to suggest other phospholipids 
may help as well. So like phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine are worth considering. Um, Eggs are a great source of phosphatidylcholine. Yes. Egg yolks. Yes, yes. And in fact, um, egg yolks in, in like taking having two egg yolks a day is a great play, a great way to support brain health, brain development. Um, and uh, curcumin, um, also uh, a great option for in inflammation. What's really interesting, this is not a supplement, but the use of naltrexone, which is a medication in very low doses, referred to as low-dose naltrexone, um, has uh, benefits for modulating the immune system. So low-dose naltrexone has actually been used for autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, um, to improve uh, the immune system. And um, in, in my practice, it's something that I use also in autism because of you know, research showing that there tends to be, it appears to be a state of low-grade inflammation hmm. uh, with um, the activation of certain immune cells in the brain called microglia. So there's definitely some uh, element of immune dysregulation. Um, and so low-dose naltrexone is another way to potentially help that. What is that, immunosuppressant? Uh, it's not. It's, it's interesting. So naltrexone is actually most commonly used for substance abuse. Hmm. It blocks the effect of opi opioids. Oh, interesting. But when you give a very, very low dose, it it blocks, uh, it actually enhances the body's natural production of endorphins um, and has immune modulating effects. So um, it's, it's almost like a, um, a way of tricking uh, the system into wow. creating more, you know, beneficial, um, you know, more of the natural chemicals that are beneficial. Wow. Any, any associated risks with, with doing that? Fortunately not. Wow. Yeah. Because it's, it's done at a very, very low dose. Um, you have to just watch out for, there can be, um, some sleep disturbance and, you know, people may respond in, in, um, uh, in unique ways, but in my experience, it's, um, it's really safe and well tolerated. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, this was so fun. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I have one last question for you, but before we get to that, where can people pick up your new book and where can they connect with you on social media? So the book Magnificent Minds will be released on April 9th. Um, um, it's available available for pre-order now. Uh, they can find me online, drsuzangoe.com, on Instagram, and also through the Cortica website, which is corticacare.com. Love it. Well, the last question that gets asked everybody on the show, what does living a genius life mean to you? Gosh, I think living a genius life has, um, for me, both a physical and a spiritual component to it. Uh, I think the two are interconnected. Um, I think it means um, recognizing that every person, including yourself, has genius within them and um, really tapping into that. I love that. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.